Welcome everybody. I'm so glad that you've gotten to hear just a little tiny taste of the absolute agility and beauty in Josephine Stoplinsberg's voice, who is tuning in tonight from Amsterdam, and it's quite late there. I'm so thrilled she can be here with us at 5 p.m. Central Time. Normally she's based in Chicago, so we appreciate her staying up late for us overseas. Josephine Stoplinberg has performed several times for the Dutch royal family and is currently performing all over the United States as a specialist of Baroque music and concert singer. She has performed most major oratorio works by Bach, Handel, Haydn, and Mozart, as well as all of the Bach cantatas for soprano solo voice. As a painter, Josephine has presented exhibitions in the Netherlands and the USA garnering international praise and attention for her colorful and imaginative paintings. Tonight, Josephine will share practicing tools for confident concert preparation and discuss creative approaches to a life in music. I just want to say we are going to wait for the Q&A till the very end. Okay, so be thinking about your questions. Make sure you write them down so you don't forget. And i um, very, very pleased to introduce you to Josephine, with who... Um, both Carlton and I have had the great pleasure of working. Welcome, Josephine. Hello there. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Great to meet you all. I'm very excited and honored to speak with you today. I saw you have been doing some amazing activities this week, and I applaud Kay Tombo and the whole Poco a Poco organization for setting up things in such a wonderful way during the pandemic. It's just been heartwarming to see how creative people have become in this whole time. And it's great to see your faces. So yes, I am currently in Europe where it is midnight. Um, it's very exciting to be in the Netherlands right now because the Dutch soccer team is playing and I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Give me one second. Let me see if this works. Slide play from start. Can you see that okay? You have to share. I thought I was sharing. Give me one second. Let me go back. Let me try it one more time. See if it works now. There we go. Okay, let me play from the start. So it is midnight here in Amsterdam. So it's a little dark. I set up some lights. So I hope it's okay. So it's very exciting. The Dutch soccer team is playing today. The last time I checked, um, they were winning from Austria with two to nothing. I'm even wearing a little bit of orange things on my dress because orange is the color of the Netherlands. And outside, there are a lot of people dressed in orange. So there are two things I wanted to share with you today, and that is practicing tools just some really useful practicing tools that I wish I would have known when I was studying voice. And secondly, talk with you a little bit about a creative life in music. Basically, we'll talk a bit about how you can use more of your talents and skills and combine them uh, in a career in music. So Let's think a little bit about this. So why do we practice in the first place? Now, it seems a little bit obvious, you know, you wanna get better, you wanna prepare. Let me just share with you, for me, the reason that I practice, rather a bit like a maniac, I, I confess. The main reason for me is that at the time of a performance, I want to let the music be able to flow through me. If I do not feel well prepared, if I'm, doubtful about the notes, worried about all kinds of technical aspects of the voice, like will this note come out properly? Will I have enough breath? Do I know it? Then that's the thing I'll be focusing on during the concert instead of the music. At the time of the concert, I want to be a full-time musician, not you know a technician. I want to be a musician. And I want to focus on the connection with the audience. If I'm tense about what's going on this connection gets lost and that's such a magical thing about performance and i'm sure all of you have experienced it and missed it over the past year just this sort of energy exchange with 
real people that cannot wait to get back. So I can only do that when my muscles know what to do, when my brain really knows the music well, and my heart can feel it. But I need to spend some time on those things. So let's look at the three important pillars of practicing, according to Josephine. So these three elements, the technical aspects, the second is the musical knowledge and the interpretation. So the technical aspect of singing is, you know, anything from learning the notes, making sure you know what each word means, the placement of the sound, the breath blending, all the technical aspects, just getting music in your voice. The musical knowledge is a bit about the piece you are singing. So basically the background of the music, the composer, the history, why was it composed, all those kind of things. We'll dive a little bit deeper into that in a minute. And thirdly, the interpretation, oops, the interpretation. So what we actually do with the music emotionally, what we understand of it and what we can share with the audience. So let's start with a bit of technical tools. Now we can have an entire week of fun with, you know, doing technical things. I'm just going to share just a few with you that I really like. Um, something I greatly enjoy doing is fast melisma. So quick stuff, high speed vocal stuff. And I thought the easiest way to share with you uh, is to share this educational video that I created for the Boulder Bach Festival during the pandemic, because I think it will make things clear when you see it. Hello, my name is Josephine Stoppelenberg, and I'll be talking a little bit about melismas and how to practice them. A melisma is something that is used often in Baroque music. It's a quick succession of notes. Handel really likes to use them a lot. Listen to this little excerpt in his Gloria. That was one of them. This particular piece actually has a lot of them. To me, it's easier to perform them if I've practiced them really thoroughly. If I break things down in little segments, my brain can deal with it better than if I just look at it at one long, difficult line. So I would break them down thinking, <laughs> so I'd emphasize the first one of every four to kind of get that into my brain. Then I'd make it a little bit more difficult, like singing them in more difficult rhythms. Okay, and now let's do it the other way around. Etc. Now, to me, it also helps to first emphasize the first of every four, then the second of every four, the third and the fourth, like this. Now let's take the second. Now the third. I actually have to look at my music for this one. And then the fourth. Now the way I breathe in those things, what helps me a lot, is actually to breathe quite high. Now, usually for singing, you want to breathe kind of deep. But if I breathe very deeply into those ones, it gets a bit heavy. <laughs> and you lose too much air. If I use what I call chihuahua breathing, it actually goes much easier. If you pretend like you're a chihuahua and you breathe <laughs> like that kind of high, and you sing through it, it's much easier. <laughs> Etc much easier than when you go with the full body. Now, the whole goal of practicing like that for me is basically to get out of the way of the music. If my brain knows what to do and my voice muscles know what to do, I can just relax and kind of sail through the music. <laughs>
that fun music it's like champagne to your ears so as you can see there are basically three things so just to sum that up a little bit break it down into smaller segments so if we see an endless string of notes it can kind of freak you out when you see them right but if we break it up in smaller bits to me it feels controllable it's uh like instead of taking a huge jump over um, a lake you kind of go over tiny little bridges so i you know i won't drown halfway it gives me sort of anchors to hold on to instead of you know thinking you know you don't you don't <laughs> you don't want that you want some kind of control so the second practicing the notes in a more difficult rhythm so when we have spent time practicing this music in a much more difficult rhythm it will actually feel rather easy doing it the original way i imagine it's a bit like practicing tightrope walking on high heels or something uh you know if you can do it on high heels it's actually quite easy on shoes. This is probably not true for tightrope walking, but you get the idea. And the third one, the chihuahua breathing, the <laughs> really helps with that quickness and that lightness. Otherwise it just gets too heavy in the body. And it's, it's funny because so many teachers tell us breathe deeply and it is so important, but there is some value to really high breathing. It's actually also really helpful if you need to take a quick snatch of breath. You know, you, you, there's no time to go all the way down sometimes, you just have to be high. So as long as you're able to balance it with some deeper breathing. Okay, so that's the speed course for speed ticketing and Chihuahua breathing, you'll see more animals coming. Uh, today, I really like animals. So for long sustained breath, actually, this is one that I like, um, especially after vacation, or if I've had a break from singing to get those muscles back into shape, blowing out the birthday candles is you blow out all your air, then you clench the muscles kind of around your core. So try it at once, take a breath, breathe out. <sighs> Now you're completely empty. Then you're clenched. One, two, three, four, five. Breathe in again. Relax. Okay, let's do it one more time. Breathe out. Clench. One, two, three, four, five. And breathe. Do you start to feel those muscles working? This is something that really helps me to sustain those long notes. It's, it's a little deeper in the body and it really gets those muscles going. So you can use that and have fun with that one. So especially in Baroque, actually, I want to talk about that later. I want to give you one more, which is singing from the language. So this is so important in all music, um, but we are so often focused on on producing a correct sort of sound that we kind of forget that a lot of music is composed from a language, especially in Baroque music and in art song where there's so much rhetoric going on. Um, to me, it helps a lot if I think, how is this spoken? How would it be pronounced naturally or convincingly or by a really famous actor? What would a famous actor do with that? And then I just try to sing it like that. And also remember, there's always a direction in language. Today is a sunny day, or today is a sunny day. Doesn't really matter where you go with it, depends on the interpretation, but you always want to go somewhere. Sometimes you get kind of focused on just producing the sound without actually feeling the direction of the language. Today is a sunny day, today is a sunny day. It always goes somewhere. So see if you can incorporate that a little bit. Speak the text that you're doing so you get a natural sort of flow of the language. So let me focus a bit on some techniques that are useful overall, but for me, very efficient in Baroque music. Let me see. Like Bach and the like, which is something I get to do a lot. So for Bach or anything that leaps quickly from low to high and back, you want to fine tune the registration of the voice. So let me explain it a little bit. Normally, we think of changing registration 
kind of in three parts, you know, if at all. We have the chest voice with a middle voice, there's a head voice, and the aesthetics and classical singing is sort of a healthy mix of all three into a nice equalized sound. And pop music, it's, it's a little bit different. They really use that head voice in a more airy way. A lot of folk music really goes deep into the chest. Uh, Broadway kind of pushes up the belting voice. So every style has a little bit of different things. But we're talking about classical right now. So you want there the equalized um, aesthetics. So to me, it really helps if I think of very fine tuned registration. So instead of thinking, oh, and I kind of have to push it up, I will go, oh. So every note has a little bit more of that tilting of the larynx, you know, this classical music gesture. So kind of find out for each note, what is the perfect setting? And I've noticed that the more precise I am in that, the easier and lighter I can jump around in music like, like Bach, which is kind of instrumental. Sometimes with Bach, you feel he considers you to be an instrument and you just have to jump around and not breathe like human beings. Um, but this really helps me. And the, the satisfying thing for me is that when I practice it that way, it really gets better. It's, it's not a, I hope it goes well. It, it gives me a lot of control, which I really want in Bach. Another thing that helps me a lot, especially in Bach, when it's a lot of long lines where there's no time to breathe, you might have done some of that, you know, this endless lines and there's like a tiny little rest where you oxygen tank, you know, you, you get some, you get some air. So for me, I like to stock up on breath. So let's see if you can do that with me. Just go like this. You just take a little bit more of air than you think you'll need. You're like stocking up on oxygen. Now you can do it kind of obvious, like, you know, and everyone will see it, but you can also do it kind of secret. You don't see it, but I'm like double breathing. So I wanted to share with you this um, final part of a very intense Bach cantata, it's the Yachts of God. And if you look closely, now you know it, you'll see that in between the phrases, I'll go, I'm just stocking up on a little bit of oxygen. So see if you can spot the secret. <laughs> I did it very secretively, but it's like double, double sneaking breath. And then I'll make it to the end and then you will avoid feeling like that. <laughs> I promise you there will be more animals. So there you go. <laughs> okay, so those were just a few of my favorite technical things. So let's look a little bit at knowledge-based preparation. Whenever you learn a new piece, see if you can ask yourself the three questions, who, when, and why? Who was the composer? Can you find out more about his or her life, the time they lived in, the circumstance they lived in? When was this written? What, what was the history? What did people live like? How was music um, experience in this specific occasion, what was going on in people's lives at that time? Was this music created for a religious service as a cantata or was it an opera? 
When was it premiered? By whom? These things really help me to connect with a piece. For instance, if you know, like the St. Matthew Passion by Bach, would be heard by the audience of his time, often after weeks of no music, because it was this, this silent time before it, it was the religious habit, and how it was entwined with sermons at the time of the performance, or a whole day immersion, basically, almost, I imagine, a sort of mystical experience, which we cannot imagine anymore, weeks of no music. We have music to our uh, access every single second of the day. Imagine the profound experience that must have been for people at the time to have that peace after weeks of silence. And it just gives me this connection with this piece and trying to understand the profundity of it. Um, or you can think, for example, certain Baroque operas, the audience would not be, you know, sitting, listening there in a very concentrated manner. Sometimes they would just be eating and drinking and talking during the performance, occasionally demanding an encore when they liked a piece particularly well. Obviously, they couldn't go and, and listen to recording because that was the moment to experience the music. So if you want to hear it again, you need to applaud really loudly and say, peace, 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 until they do it again. Some music was really meant to be listened to intently. Other music was just meant to dance on or to provide a sort of chic ambiance for a royalty or a court, something expensive sounding, a status. So to me, that really helps to connect with the music, to understand the circumstance. And it helps me in my interpretation as well. So let's go to an important aspect of singing. Oops, I think I need to get that away. Hmm. Oops. There. Interpretation. So in the end, in my opinion, the voice is just an instrument for interpretation, for communication with an audience. And I feel strongly that it's an important aspect of being a musician, as important as the technical side. And I know from my own experience how much time and effort it costs to get to that point of feeling technically secure um, that you can start thinking about interpretation. But I think it should always go like that. You cannot leave it to the last moment. It needs to go together. And it needs both things. Just interpretation and no technique to back it up is also not satisfying. It needs those, those two things. And I think with the enormous amount of perfect recordings that are out there right now um, of any classical piece in the, on the planet, the pressure to perform close to perfection in concert halls is just rather big because that's what people are used to hearing on, on recordings. Um, in my opinion, interpretation in the end is what it's about, this, this connection with the audience. I sometimes feel classical music needs a bit more of, of that focus. Um, I have a lot of students and many young students say, I worry about focusing on classical music because it's, there are so many recordings out there, they're all perfect. I feel I just need to fit this mold that already exists. It has nothing to do with my inner world. And I think we need to break through that because classical music represents every possible emotion on the planet you know from the most noble sentiments to ecstasy to silliness and humor to rawness to immense grief to just cheerful fun anything you can think of it's all there but we need to get a little bit away of this perfect sound design. We need to connect it with our own soul, with our own voice. And I wanna give you a few tools that you can just practice it because that's something we need to practice as well. So you see here five different emotions that you can practice a song in. Now, it doesn't really matter what you know, emotion or feeling is in a certain song, you can still try them in different ways. So for instance, if we would have a phrase like, it's over, and we're going to first sing it very sad, like with a very sad vocal call, like, it's over, like very dark, very sobbing. We can sing it very relieved. It's over, 
it's a very different vocal sound. Intuitively, you do other things. The airflow balance with the voice resistance is very different. That's the technical aspect of it. But let's focus on the direct emotional uh, um, way. Now, let's do it very silly. It's over. So it's very bouncy. The vibrato is a little bit quicker. Now, let's do it very soothing. It's over very warm and very calm we do other things and angry it's over a different sort of sound so when we speak we do that naturally right when you're angry you talk in a very different way than when you're just excited about something or when you're just really bored or you don't care so we we have that natural tendency in speaking it's just that often in singing we're so focused on it needs to be a certain sound and do everything in that sound. And I would just like to invite you to see if you can really connect every piece you do with your own voice, with your own emotion. And what we what happens when we do that is that an audience will feel that you have lived a bit with that piece. They can feel it's more yours, there's more of you in it. And an extra benefit that actually a lot of my students experience is that it can remove a bit of stage fright at nerves because the focus becomes the music, the connection with the audience, the emotion at not, am I living up to technical expectations? You see what I mean? So see if you can experiment with that. In fact, you can also try it a bit with your voice, like what happens when you talk in a more soothing way to someone or different, like when you talk like that all the time, it has a different sound. Start to listen to other people's voice and how it affects you. Because when the speaking voice has a lot of soul, it's easier to make that leap to a soulful sort of singing. Okay. On to the next thing, and sorry for the silliness. What sort of animal is your voice? So, there are different body types, right? Different personality types and voice types. Now, of course, in opera, we already divide those voices into a fach, you know, lyric soprano, coloratura soprano, heldentenor, that's your voice type. And these are the roles that would fit you well. But let's look a little deeper into that. What does your voice naturally want? What does it have a natural aptitude to? And I'm, I'm urging you to think about that because to me, once I realized what sort of animal my voice wanted to be, and I started practicing that, then I felt I became really good instead of trying to fit something that I didn't have a natural ability for. So in my case, my voice loves doing quick things. You've heard a little bit of that. Um, jumping around, quick movements, as you heard in the handle and the Bach. I do not need much time to warm up vocally, but I also do not enjoy singing for too long and too loud and too sad. It makes me tired in my voice, in my body and in my soul. I think that's partly why I really like Baroque music. It's a little bit lighter structured. It's very buoyant. It has a lot of energy to it. I can listen to it a long time and sing it a long time and not get tired. I love singing dramatic stuff as well, but after about an hour or two, it's like, I think I want to go home now or, you know, put on colorful socks or something a bit more fun. But that's me. There are other people who are very, very different. Other people get energy from symphonies of Mahler, it, the, the, it recognizes their being, they get fueled by it. So I would say this is my voice. <laughs> but this one it likes to jump. I once did a masterclass with a soprano, I'm pulling up the horse for her. She sang a lot of Wagner. So she would take five hour walks before a performance to properly warm up her body before even starting to warm up her voice. But after that, she could sing loud and long for a long time to the huge voice. So she had a voice a bit more like this handsome horse here. Of course, it's a little silly just to compare our voices with animals, but I would just love for you to think about what sort of music fuels your soul and drains you. 
because often it's correlated with the sort of voice you have. If you are going to dedicate a big chunk of your life to music, the chances are that you'll enjoy it much more if it's music that fits your personality. And this is just sometimes hard in a conservatory. You know, you're just supposed to fit in a certain mold and they want to prepare you for life. It's not always very aimed to what actually fits this specific person. Now, more often than not, what you like tends to fit your physique as well. It correlates with your athletic ten, uh, tendencies. So for instance, in my case, I'm a good sprinter. I can actually run really fast. I cannot do long endurance sports, long swimming, long running. I don't even want to think about that. But there are people who get energy from that. I just get exhausted. Often this goes together. If you like a bit more bouncy, lighter music, the physique tends to be a bit more explosive. So just think about that. What do I do? What do I like athletically? How, how does it correlate with my voice and the sort of music that you like? So let's move on to the final segment of today's presentation, Creative Life in Music. Questions. Oh yeah, I wanted to show this one. This is like someone with long soaring lines. That is like not my strength, but I know some people have this beautiful Strauss sort of line that just floats on forever. Let me see. So let's talk a little bit about a creative life in music. And I wish that someone would have talked about this when I was a little bit younger. I would love for you to think about what other talents, what additional talents and skills do you naturally have or have you developed that you could potentially combine with a singing or musical career to craft a very personal, unique career that fits with you. Um, because if you're able to combine more talents, it's more fulfilling for you. You create a uniqueness about yourself as an artistic being, and it's fun. It, it fits with you. Now, I really like teaching. I love people, the difference in every personality. I love meeting them, helping them improve their techniques so they get this confidence to perform. But I also enjoy hearing their specific personality through the voice, both in singing as in speaking. I actually also coach people who are giving TED Talks or do other public speaking engagement because our speaking voice tells an audience so much about someone's personality. You know, you can have this great idea. But if you have a voice like that and try to get at people, it's just not going to work. So the speaking voice is very important. And it's interesting because we don't always pay clear attention to it. We're so focused on, do I look nice? Do I have makeup, the clothes? But how someone speaks says so much about your personality. Um, I remember a student I once had who had the problem that no one seemed to really notice her and people would like, walk over her. She was very soft spoken, would not fill a space with her personality, very held back. So I got her to practice filling a space with her natural resonance, with her whole voice, to take up space vocally. And that solved the problem. And it was wonderful and fascinating to me to see what effect a speaking voice has, speaking voice has on other people. So teaching, I really love. Um, that's something you could always think about. Do you like children? Do you have a connection with that? Do you prefer groups or is individual a better match for you? My second life, apart from music, is painting. I regularly create paintings on commissions for people and you can see they are very colorful. Now, a lot of them have musical instruments in them. And when I would perform in a specific place or festival, I would often just give the conductor or artistic director a little gift of note cards uh, with my paintings. And without that really being the intention, it has actually led to many posters of music festivals with my art on it, which is just wonderful. Here's one of the Arizona Bach Festival who used a painting of mine. And that became kind of my ideal combination. I go there, I perform a concert, I get to do a masterclass with young talents, and they use a painting on a post-it. To me, that's absolutely heaven. Um, Boulder Bach Festival also used a painting for their, for their festival. 
I've created several CD covers for musicians who reached out to me to make art for their album cover. Here you see a commission for harpsichord and traverso that became into this lovely CD. And here's one more for a British composer, Paul Ayres, who commissioned a painting for his CD, Rainbow Toccatas. As you can see, it's for organ and kind of the rainbow colors that he wanted in it. Recently, I started adding paintings to my favorite orchestral works. Um, I learned video, video editing, as probably a lot of you did over the past year. Here's a little bit of Mother Goose by Ravel. It's a fairy tale about uh, a, a girl who accidentally ends up somewhere in Asia and gets put into a bath by little pagode people. It's very, very cute. <laughs> music i really like that now over the past year i've been able to use more visual skills um with making virtual choirs but also using a little bit of my own art in it maybe you know this very whimsical piece by eric whitaker and i was able to create a digital little yellow silly canary <laughs> animals this is so cute um so yeah to use a bit of that whimsical naive style that was just really fun um it's just a useful to combine different things over the past year i used a bit of the no performance and no traveling time to record a cd contemporary music all for cello and voice music that never before had been recorded and uh, by the way this was just accepted at navona records which is wonderful but in order to get money to record it and not spend a lot of money on it ourselves we had to get sponsorships i had to get people enthusiastic about this music so i created several videos with a little bit of this music using the visual skills again in combination with music which helped us to get a lot of funding for the cd and it's something we'll use for cross marketing so we cross market the cd as an audio, but also as video art. So especially in contemporary music, which is just a little harder to digest for the ears because it's all new, it helps to have a little bit of a visual component. So that has really helped us. 
So I would love for you to think about what other skills do I have? What do I naturally do when I'm relaxing? What recharges me? Am I good at organizing? Um, are you good at social things? Would you be able to start your own concert series or lecture about music? The cellist from the string quartet told me that everyone in her string quartet has sort of a different function. One is really good at fundraising. One is really good at social media. One is really good with talking with the people once they're in the concert hall. And all these things have a specific function in their performing life. Let me just give you a few other examples that you can think about. Um, I have a friend who is an art historian and a wonderful mezzo. She gives lectures about the paintings of Rembrandt with a lot of history there. And then she sings music that would have sounded in that time with instruments that are depicted on the paintings. So she'll project those paintings, you can see them and you will hear the music of that time. Another student of mine is a nurse in, what's the English word, palliative care, but terminally, terminally ill uh, people. She would find out what music or what songs these terminally ill people loved and would sing those for them or with them if possible. I thought it was just so inspiring. Um, another Dutch friend of mine is a great alto and she has a master's in German language and literature. So she would perform German song cycles and give talks about how the music and the literature work together. So I'm just try trying to get your brain going a little bit. Like, what are you good at? Are you connected with a specific kind? Do you want to be on the front stage? Are you focusing on, do you, would you like an opera career? Do you know what kind of life that would be like? A lot of traveling, a lot of time away from family, but it might be worth it if you really like it. Um, I have a colleague here in Chicago area and he's very good bass. You know, he could sing anywhere. He's very tall. He looks great on stage, but he just loves being with his family. So everyone in the Chicago area hires him because he's there and occasionally he goes here or there, but not for long projects. He teaches at a college, he sings in all the professional choirs and he gets hired a lot for oratorio work. Oratorio work is great too. You go somewhere, um, you have one or two rehearsals, you perform and you go home. It's more combinable with other things. If you have a family or there are other things you like to do. So the music industry needs many sorts of people to keep running. And if you're just looking to surround yourself with music, there's just many paths on top of just performing. Social media has become big over the last years. If you enjoy do that, you can help yourself a lot or musical organizations. Let me just share another thing that I think is very moving. Um, <laughs> There is a Dutch organization called Diva, Diva's Dichtbij, Diva's Close By, and it brings excellent singers to nursing homes with people with Alzheimer. This singer, Jan Willem Baljets, a very well known singer in the Netherlands, he does a lot of opera, oratorio, ensemble. And here you can see him do something else that I think is very moving. So this is just so moving to me to see that, um, you know, if you have a sort of healing personality in you or you, you have that energy to give to these people, that's a fantastic thing to add. Art therapy or music therapy is also wonderful. Um, so I would love with you to brainstorm a little bit or, or see if you have any questions. I wanna show you one more fun video called The Moon Bridge by black composer Florence Price. It's a very colorful video, a very airy fairy with a lots of colors. And while you look at that, you can start thinking a little bit about what, what would fit with you and if you have any questions.
stop it right there because I realize we only have 10 minutes left. I would love to answer some questions if you might have some. Did you make that video too, Josephine? What's that? Did you make that video for Apollo Chorus too? I did, yes. Wow. Yes, several organizations hired me over the past year and it's been a steep learning curve, um, you know, to, to learn all those things and sometimes frustrating to get a lot of videos done, but it's, I think, a skill I will use, be able to use for the rest of my life. I see a raised hand. Let's see who this is. Uh, I don't see a name, but you have really lovely red curls. Corinne Francis. Natalie, oh, okay. Oh, sorry. Yes, um, I can see you. So I also do visual art, but I am also a musician at the same time. So I was just wondering like how you balance those two worlds um or whether they combine and you yeah do you find it hard to combine it like at the same time is that the the like running into i'm sorry i worded this badly <laughs> um like how much of your visual art influences your music and vice versa to me it's really mutually inspiring and i'm really both um if i only sing i just feel unfulfilled at some point it's like i get full of paintings that just need to get out of me so i paint them and then i'm fine again and if i only paint i i need to sing again so it really it really ban balances each other and right now i'm just trying to get it more and more together so it really becomes a marriage of those two elements before it had been more separate you know there would be paintings and they were singing and I, I really enjoy that it gets more together right now um uh last year was two years ago the peoria symphony also used some of my paintings when they did the pa pictures and exhibition of Mussorgsky. so they projected it on, on a big screen while playing the music and i really like that so i'm just always looking now for more of that specific combination of art and music and, and hope you can do the same are you already using it in some way as a combination or is it more separate for you right now? Yeah, um, I would be nowhere without music. I find myself creating pieces based on songs. I actually was commissioned by Kate to do um, a piece inspired by a poem which became a song. And so Great. I'm going to be using that later in the festival. That'll be um, unveiled on June 26th. Oh, it's yeah. exciting. So um, I personally like to combine it, but um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, good luck. Just yeah, just see if you can somehow get it together, get those two things together because you have those two talents and the more you can use them to your advantage, the better. It's great. I look forward to seeing some of your work. And then we have, I think, Nat Natalin Wolinski. Sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, my question is, um, I have too many things in my life that I want to do. <laughs> uh huh. And so I guess, is there any sort of balance that can come like using your experience? Um, how do you balance everything? I don't think we should choose. Uh, I once read a delightful book called refuse to choose by barbara share it it it's about people i think like you they, she calls them scanners meaning they like a lot of things um and just don't want to choose one thing because then they think i don't want to not do all the other things well maybe you're not supposed to do one thing into the depth maybe you're supposed to know a lot about a lot of different i mean that's a strength uh, some people are just more in the depth, other people kind of spark 
tackle on the surface, there's a lot that can be a, a strength too, that you know a lot about a lot of different things. It would help you when you're a writer because you would know a lot, for instance. Um, you would be able to connect with different sort of people. So instead of thinking, this is wrong that I like too many things, I would think, what is the strength of that? Like, how can I use that to my advantage? I don't think it's bad. I think it's, it's, if you love many things, it needs to be lived out. I feel all the things we love need to be lived out for some reason and, and just go with that, with, with your nature. It will, it will lead to something. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank yeah. you for sharing. Let's see, we have uh, Molly Ewan, Ewan. I hope I pronounced it right. Um, yeah, close enough. It's not important. Anyway, um, did you know you, um, you said that they like used your art? Did they ask you? Yeah, and and often um, I wouldn't go to them like, do you want to use my art? It was like I would perform somewhere and you know, I would chat and uh, I remember at a, sp a specific point it was this conductor who said, do you know there's someone with your name who paints and like that's that's me so then it kind of came around and often like i would give them the little note card sets uh or if we would chat i would just tell them about it it was not very pushy in in their face at all it would just kind of come naturally and i you know i post paintings on facebook and a lot of musicians who know me from there and also see uh, the painting so that's kind of how it came about it was never really a direct intention but it it, it might have been i might have been farther if i would have been more intentional with that i was just worried because it sounded like when the way you said it it sounded like you gave them a note card and then they just used the note card at the poster and i was like oh no 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 they always they always ask me and sometimes they pay me and um it's it's a bit part of the of, of the financial life right now. In the beginning, I was very much like, oh, you know, it's fine. This is wonderful. And now it's compensated. Um, but I was just checking because I was like, oh, yeah, no, that's that's a good that's that's good that you want to be. That most people are just really nice about. It. They don't just run away with it. Let's see. We have Leah Tomano. Yes. Um, I was wondering. Uh, how long have you been singing slash painting? And um, I know that you had talked about finding like what your voice likes. When did you kind of discover what that was? Like really fall in, like you know your voice likes to um, bounce, I guess. Um, Actually quite late. I think not before I was about 28 or 29 that I felt, huh, this is kind of where it belongs. and. You know, I was good in, in different ways too. At a young age, I won a lot of competitions and was on TV a lot. And I, I did a lot of stuff, but it just always felt a bit like putting on a mask. Whereas with this, I feel I can be genuine and I can be real because it fits me more. It fits my personality more. And I felt I had more control also over the things that are not very naturally easy to me. Once I practiced more the things that were easy to me, so focus more on the things that came natural than other things also went easier. So yeah, that, that's been a great help for me. I forgot your first question. Oh yeah, um, well, I grew up in a musical family. My dad's a composer, my mom is a pianist, and my sister is a singer. And I started in children's choirs at a young age. In fact, choral singing has been there all my life until about five years ago. And I think that's where I learned most music most about singing because you you get that stamina you get the ensemble you get the listening you get the repertoire I, I would not have wanted to miss that for the world and only later it it really came into a certain repertoire but i've always done choral singing i think it's fantastic that's great thank you yeah and then we have courtney bailey hi there hi um so like I I'm an artist of many others here. I also compose. Um, I love language, things like that. Um, like something that I've like constantly been like looking into, like because it's something I'm interested in is like, you know, how would you go about getting not necessarily getting yourself out there, but like perhaps like what platforms do you use 
um, like whether it's for art or for music. I know there's plenty out there and like, how do you like, I guess, kind of make contacts in a way? I know like personally, like around here, I'm not like involved with like churches, for example, because it's not something I grew up doing or like going around. Um, I guess just like getting the fact that, hey, like I do these things out there, like how maybe would you go about doing that? Well, what kind of like what kind of music would you like to do with other people? What like out there? What is what is your goal? What would be a good fit right now? Um, I would like to personally get music that I've written out there. Um, because I mean, I would like to actually write sheet music. So like that could possibly maybe want to be published. I don't know, but as of right now, I simply make tracks. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Um, sometimes it's either just piano or sometimes I want to have voice to it. I've written a couple of, is that even the right English? I don't know. Um, I've made a couple songs with German lyrics because German is a language that I'm studying. Um, so possibly things like that or like jazz is something that I definitely enjoy because I play bass. Yeah, so there's a wide variety of things. I mean, I would start with getting sort of a network around you of people who know about your music, see if you can get some friends or, or you know, colleagues or people from, you know, Poco or Poco, see if they can perform it, you can perform it yourself. Um, I mean, from my own experience, I know that it takes a bit of what I call bulldogging, uh, meaning you just have to keep reaching out to people. Uh, I remember when I came to the States from the Netherlands about 11 or 12 years ago, you know, it came out of the blue and I had no work. I was going to stay for one or two years, but I wanted to work there as well. So I would just email tons of people out of the blue and most of them would not react, but maybe one in every 10 back and maybe one out of every 10 people who emailed me back would lead to a concert. So that's a lot of emails and a lot of calls and a lot of ugh feeling. Um, but usually once they hire me, they'll, they'll hire me back, which I prepare really well. I really try to do uh, my best. So it's kind of building it up over time. And I think having a bit of a network, that's a, a, a bit harder with, I think, with a creative musician, um, like a composer or a painter, the danger for isolation is just a little bigger. And, and isolation is, is dangerous to connect with people I think is important. And right now it's easier with social media. I mean, I, I post my paintings on Facebook, occasionally a, a, a good performance. Um, visual things I think are easier because, you know, people can just see it quickly. They don't have to click on it or when it's longer than three seconds, you know, they often go past it. Um, sending email newsletters to people has also helped just to, to get people aware of that you're working on things. It doesn't have to be perfectly done or perfectly finished but that you're working on things, you're out there. Um, so that's probably the first I would wanna, I wanna dive into. Yeah, and get it, get it nicely organized to like, have your pieces or your work in progress in one place and just keep sending things out what you're working on. I think that's the main thing. Yes, let me see if I see any other hands. Oh, hi, Carlton Monroe, how nice. <laughs> it's also someone I just emailed out of the blue when I came to the States and he happened to be in Chicago and he said, yeah, let's meet. And then we made some music and I've gone to Cincinnati a few times and performed with Kate and with Carlton, which is wonderful. Um, so that's part of the bulldogging, which sometimes we need to do. So, yeah, it's been wonderful uh, hearing your thoughts. And I hope this gets you thinking about a few things, using more of your skills. It doesn't always have to be creative, organization skills, financial awareness skills. Um, just be creative with what, what you already are able to do and see if you can combine that somehow, just add it to your career. I mean, the, the times are changing very fast. And I think the more things are tailored to you, just the more satisfying it is to yourself instead of just thinking of one track that you make it or you don't make it like what works for me for my personality for my vision what i have with my life and i think it makes it much more fun and enjoyable 
So good luck with that. Yay. Amen. You know, um, that was, I mean, you know, I know that that's just scratching the surface and we could talk to you for so long. Thank you for that wonderfully enthusiastic, informative. Carlton and I were saying, I don't know how you have energy at this time of the night in Amsterdam. Oh, <laughs> but we are so glad. I was assuming there had to be some kind of caffeine in there at some point. 